Good evening, students, both those in sitting in front of me and those who are at home tonight or wherever you are watching on the computer. <clears throat> we are on Romans 6a notes, which is covering the second chapter of the book of Romans. We are on note 34, and I want to... Tonight, I'm going to read, often we use the New King James, and from time to time I will bring in other translations. Um, tonight, I'm going to read from the Tree of Life version, and actually, I am going to read down through four, and then we will read five. Therefore, you are without excuse, O man, every one of you who is judging. For by whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. We know that God's judgment on those who practice such things is based on truth. But you, O oh man, judging those practicing such things, yet doing the same, do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you belittle the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? not realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance. Remember that Paul is basically in chapter 2 addressing the Jewish people, his Jewish readers. He dealt very much with Gentile societies in chapter 1. Now he is dealing with the Jews in chapter 2. So he has said, don't you know that it's the goodness of God? It's not your position, it's not your favorite status that you think you have, but it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. Now, the word, Greek word for repentance here is metanoia. And if you've been a, around our classes any length of time at all, you know, we've looked at this word, <clears throat> metanoia. And this is a word that means a change of mind. One of the tragedies with language is the fact that our English word repentance comes from the Latin. And so we have lost some of the real meaning of the Greek word, which was the language in which the new Testament was penned. But this means a change of mindset, a turning from and a turning to. So it means a turning from your way to God's way, which is the reverse of what we read in Isaiah 53, because it's talking about what is the definition of sin. Everyone has turned to his own way. But now it's turning, repentance, metanoia, is turning from your way to God's way. And thus one could say that it means to change one's mind, which is associated with a corresponding behavior. When you have changed your mindset, your behavior should follow. So repentance implies a radical change in one's view of things. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a different view of sin today than you had before you turned from your way to God's way? Yes. Of course. So it means specifically a change of mind about sin. And it means a change in one's thoughts. The things that you used to think about, that you like to think about, you don't think about that anymore. One's purposes. Do you have a different purpose now? Yes, I would hope so. I would hope that as a, as a follower of Jesus, you have a different purpose and are aware of having a different purpose than before and one's conduct. 
when you read in the New Testament where it says, let your conversation be, actually, and, and we've looked at that in the Greek, <clears throat> remember that doesn't mean yakety yakety. It means what? Your conduct. Let your conduct be as becoming a Christian. Okay. So repentance is a change of mind that results in an action of the will. I will to serve the Lord. I will to follow Jesus. And repentance is not simply negative. Because sometimes we get the idea, and again, that comes from the fact that we get our English word repentance from the Latin, which basically means a penance, um, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm just bawling and squalling, and so sorry, so sorry. And I need to do penance. That's where we get the word repentance. And some people get it, it's just so negative. But that is not, it's not simply negative. There is a turning from your way. But it means turning to a new life in Christ. Life. It's a life of active service to God. And this is why I have a problem. When I hear people say, well, I've been a, a Christian for 20 years. And they have no love for the word, no desire to be with other believers. In fact, they live their life the same as they lived it before. They just say, well, I'm a Christian now. I, I do what they told me to do. I'm a Christian now. How many know Jesus has changed us? He has changed our outlook. He's changed our upward look. He should have changed our inward look if we will allow him to do so. It's true. It said, all things are passed away and are still passing away. Behold, all things have become new and are still becoming new every single day. We should love the Lord more today than yesterday because we should know him better. So there is something that, that happens in our being. So Paul is saying that. He said, don't you know it's the goodness of God that has led you to the point of turning to his way. And he's trying to talk to these Jewish believers and Jewish non-believers. And he is basically putting down, as it were, a court case. I'm making my case for this, and I want you to see this. Because they're saying, well, we're so much better than those Gentiles. Their sin is so much worse than our sin. Verse 5. But by your hard and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment is revealed. He will, thank you. He will pay back each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good are seeking glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and fury. There will be trouble and hardship for every human soul that does evil. Now here's the key. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul will, Paul has already used this particular phrase, has he not, in chapter 1. But Because he said what? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek, which basically encompasses all of Gentiles. So what Paul was saying, he said, listen, it was first delivered to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. He said, if you think that you're going to escape judgment because you are Jewish, because of your status as the natural people of God, that is not going to be able to be used as an excuse. Because if you, if, if you are outside of Christ, Jew or Gentile, you will be judged. Okay? 
for there is no partiality with God. None. For all who have sinned outside of Torah. Now, the concept, actually the, the Jewish concept of Torah is not law in the sense of what we have, this idea of a legal uh, document. No, Torah is teaching. So we would say what? The word of God. This is the teaching, right? And so basically say for all who have sinned outside of knowing God's word. Will also perish outside of Torah, out of the word of God. And all who have sinned according to the word will be judged by the word. For it is not the hearers of the word, Torah, who are righteous before God. Rather, it is the doers of Torah who will be, and that's righteousified. Or when, and, I, and it is, because it, just, just so you'll know that I've done my, my, home, my homework, it is dekayu. Okay, so it is a dekayu word, righteousness. It is not a justified word. It is a righteousified word. For when Gentiles who do not have the Torah do by nature, and by nature is what? That, that deposit of conscience that God has placed in us, do by nature the things of the Torah. In other words, by, based on their conscience, they do things that we are told or we are to do in the word or we aren't to do in the word. He said, if they do that, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the teaching of God. They show that the work of the Torah is written in their hearts, that part that is written in the conscience. And all this, if you remember the revelation chart, all this goes back to that revelation chart. God has made himself known. Their conscience, and here we, we have it again, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts switching between accusing or defending them on the day when God judges the secrets of men according to my good news through Messiah Yeshua. Um, now, just, I, I want to do something about I want to briefly do this because I find that even among Christians, there is some confusion regarding the judgments. There are going uh, to be two judgments. They occur at different times and they have a different focus. And I, so I want to try to just briefly set that up so you will understand. The first one is what is called the Bema, B-E-M-A, Bema Judgment Seat of Christ. And the subjects of that judgment are only believers, only faithers. And it will occur after the rapture and before the millennium. So it's going to happen in that, on earth, that seven year period when we are in heaven. And the focus of this judgment is to determine rewards for service. Those things that you've done because you love the Lord and you know his word and you did it for no other motivation than what? That you wanted to serve him. And there's, there's, there are scriptures that, re, that talk about that. And it's going, those, those works are going to be judged how? By fire. By fire. And if the motivation for doing those works was that which was perishable, wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to burn up. Gold, silver, and precious stones. What happens with fire with that? It's gonna, they're going to last. So those are rewards for service. That's only the believers. 
Then there is what is called the great white throne judgment. And the subjects of this judgment are only unbelievers, or disfavors. And the great white throne judgment will not occur until after the thousand year reign of Christ, the Messiah. And that will take place in between the end of the millennium and the new heaven, new earth, the eternal age. And that's something else that's kind of important. Um, we only have two chapters that refer to the beginning of the eternal age. Um, so all I know is it's going to be marvelous. It's going to be as it was in the beginning. And understand the Garden of Eden, what we call the Garden of Eden, was basically a little bit of heaven on earth, right? I mean, it was perfect environment. I mean, everything was, was perfect for Adam and Eve. And when you look at those, those last two chapters of Revelation, you see the new, that new heaven coming down from God of heaven to earth. And he's sitting somewhere, proximity of Jerusalem. But we also know that the Jerusalem uh, in the millennium is going to reach its ideal borders. And what do we have happening in the new heaven, the new, new earth, and what we call the eternal age? Well, the little glimpse we have is says it will be as it was in the beginning. So all I, all I can tell you, it is going to be a perfect environment forever and ever unending. Unending. And that happens after the millennium and after the white throne judgment. You have the, and all we know are those little glimpses given in Revelation 21, 22. It kind of just kind of pulls back the curtain and we can just kind of see into the eternal age. And then you, after you get that peak, is it any wonder that John says, even so come Lord Jesus. Because, and by the way, Actually, that should read in Greek with this intensity. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. In other words, he has just seen a glimpse of the eternal age, and he understands what is happening prior to that. And the intensity is, oh, come, come, Lord Jesus, with a great intensity. So I hope that clears it up because some people seem to get confused about the judgments, when they're going to happen, who's going to be at the judgment seat. Okay. Yes, So Rita. the persons that have never heard the word and it says that they're a law unto themselves, where do they fit in that? Okay, they will be judged and we will, as we move on, we'll actually you will see more of that, but they will be judged according to the knowledge that they have. Now, having said that, understand every single person who has ever lived or ever will live has a certain knowledge of revelation of God, whether they receive it or not. So they will be judged, but they will be judged on the basis of the light they have. Now, what I mean by that, and I all I know is that is what the Bible teaches. Now, as far as the, the, the intricate details, we're not giving those, but I would... It, but the indication is this, if you have all knowledge, all the knowledge you can have and reject, what about your condemnation? It will be great and then you reject. That condemnation and judgment will be greater than someone who had less knowledge. Still rejected, still judged, but it's very clear from the book of Romans, even as we go on, that the judgment is greater. And as we move on in, into 
it will even give us a little more detail about that. Okay. So guilt. Oh, Crystal. I'm sorry. Uh, it will be. It will be. Well, Christ will be the. It will be the judge as well. What did you do with? What did you do with salvation offered through Jesus Christ? And he will do what? He said he opens the books. Or, you know, obviously, you know, if you if you're in the Lamb's Book of Life, you you already had the beam of judgment seat, so got your rewards. What did you do with? With Christ, and then the books. Remember, you're going to, they're going to be judged, even <coughs> if they didn't know that the level of the judgment is going to be based on what this. Because see, there are going to be some people who, without the knowledge of the Word of God, obeyed by conscience. And having said that, there have been missionaries who have reached very, very backward tribes. And when they got there, no, many people had never, ever seen a person outside of their tribe. And yet they have discovered that they have some kind of a concept, concept of God. Sometimes they even have a concept in their, in their ledges that they have, have passed on down through the generations of some kind of an atoning sacrifice. Where did that come from? God. You see, as I, this is what I tell people and what I have to remind myself about unsaved loved ones. As much as you love them, God loves them even more. Sure. The Apostle Paul said, you worship God. Yeah. They were worshiping a God that they didn't know. That's right. So he revealed to them who that God was. That's right. Yeah. And so so many missionaries will talk about how that even makes it easier when they go because they already have a concept and it's basically the same thing when Paul went to Mars Hill. He said, now let me tell you about that God. And so when they get there and they tell their stories, they said, let me now fill you in. Or as Paul Harvey would say, let me tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> you already have this. Here's the rest of the story. Thank you. But we serve a big God. So we know that there are results of guilt. And guilt must be released. Released, yeah, released. So no one must live in guilt. And here again is the difference between the plan of the Old Testament, which God initiated that plan to do what? To cover sins, blood was shed, the sacrifices, took care of the sin, but not the guilt. And I say that because when you understand that it it basically that blood of bulls and goats covered, okay, and, and by the way, covered it for another year through the Old Testament sacrificial system that you had. You had sin sacrifices, the trespass offering that you brought. But the lamb that was slain for the nation was slain only from one year to the next year. And when you would bring your sin offering, you left from offering that offering, or, or the trespass offering, with this, with this view before you. When you brought your animal to be sacrificed, you had to lay your hands on that animal. And through an imputation, that, that animal received your sin. And then you didn't just willy-nilly walk away, okay, I've taken care of that. No, I'm going to go out and play now. No. You stood there as the priest 
would slice the jugular vein and the carotid artery and the blood would spill out. And you stood there knowing that was an innocent animal who took you in, 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 in uh, type, took your sins, and as that animal bled out and quivered and died at your feet, you realized, even as you left there, knowing that God accepted that sacrifice of that animal for your sins, that's because of me. That's because of me. Because of my sin, that innocent animal quivered and died right there. And plus, you still had the guilt. And guilt has to be, and no one today has to live in guilt. And if held, guilt will bring suffering. But now, through Christ and his atoning work, not only is our sin condition taken care of and our sins, but so is the guilt, because he also took the guilt. Now, Paul says to these believers, and he's speaking of these Jewish believers. He said, but by your hard and unrepentant heart. Now hardness, the hardness of your heart, and I'm giving you the word and you will probably see something in this Greek word, sclerotata. How many have ever heard of arteriosclerosis? What is arteriosclerosis? Hardening of the arteries. It's hard. Scleroderma. That's when the dermis, the skin, becomes hardened. So this refers to a resistant or stubborn attitude with regard to any change in behavior. So Paul is describing the hard and impenitent hearts of his unsaved religious re readers. Because what they were trusting in was the law of Moses and their favorite status before God, and that's what their trust was in. So stubbornness is a, that, that's a typo. It's stubbornness is a perverse, an unyielding attitude. In other words, well, I'm not coming that way. I'm not going to do that. I mean, I've heard, heard well-known people say, oh, I'm never going to ask God to forgive me of my sins. I don't have any. <laughs> well, understand something. The minute you said that, if you didn't before, which I think, but even if even if you hadn't any before, you have now because you're just you're guilty of the sin of lying. And I will also say this: if you pray hard enough and trust the Lord enough, God can even touch a heart like that. And I say that because we have many many examples in the Word of God of it. But I think the, one of the best ones is Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, look at me. And then even when God gave him the, the image, remember the image of gold? Oh, I'm gold. I'm not the head of gold. Look at the kingdom that I built. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, he had to live like an animal. But at the end of the breaking process, he said, now I praise the God of heaven, and did. The problem is it just didn't pass on to his sons and grandsons. But he did. And of course, the best example in the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. I mean, he, man, I'm going to get those people. I uh, just give me the authority, and I'm going to bring them. I'm going to go and get them from the farthest corners and bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. Until God got a hold of him, 
until Jesus revealed himself to him. And we're talking about what? An absolute turnaround. So God can, but there has to be a willingness to do what? To receive. So this is a picture of the spiritual condition of a heart that has become unresponsive, doesn't respond, and insensitive to God. Oh, un, uh, unresponsive of a heart that has become unresponsive and insensitive, insensitive to God. Now, sometimes we just have a sensitive heart for God. That, and other people, you know, it's like, look to the hand. Let's look at the hand. I don't want you to do this. <laughs> and in note 39, it says, hardening of the arteries may take a person to the grave. But the hardening of one's spiritual heart will take one to hell. The wrath of God fell on Jesus so that it need not fall on you. Understand? The wrath. I love that picture. I love the picture in Galatians. Um, I can find it. I need to find it quickly. Uh, just now came to me. But, uh, and it reads in a certain way, but if you look at it in the Greek, the picture, basically, anyhow, the, the okay, but um, I will try to find it. it Time sake. But what talks about that the curse fell on Christ and not us. And what happens is there's a word picture there in the Greek, and it's that, okay, the curse is ready to fall, and you're here. And the curse is ready to fall, and the picture is of Christ coming and doing this, and it falls on him. And that is, in essence, what happened. The, the wrath of God fell on Jesus. And the atoning work of Christ pushed us out of the way. And the curse and the wrath of God fell on him. And it doesn't have to fall on us. It's not Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having made a curse, having made a curse for us. Yes. That's 3.13. Yes. Yes. And that word picture there in the Greek, that's what it is. In other words, it's, I mean, and actually it is just ready, just like you are right underneath it, and it is ready to hit you in this took place. But that wrath will fall on you if you fail to take refuge in Christ's atoning work. In other words, as he came to move you out of that curse falling, if you stubbornly say, I don't know, I don't need you to take this, well, guess what? The curse, the wrath of God's going to fall. So it either fell on Christ in his atoning work at the cross for you, or it will fall in judgment. And what Paul is trying to tell these Jewish people who are taking, taking uh, comfort in the wrong thing, trusting the wrong thing, Unrepentant, and again, we, we get a little bit of Greek lesson. Some of you are picking up Greek just as we go through the book of Romans. <laughs> because what do you notice about this Greek word right away? A. There's an A in front of it, which means what? Moves it, re moves it in reverse. So this is a metanoiatin, which is the reverse of metanoia, the reverse of repentance. So unrepentance is admitting no change of mind. No, I'm not changing my mind. You're not going to, 
And I hear this many times when you're dealing with people or the loss of, well, I'm not going to change my mind about this either. I'm just not. Keep praying. And maybe they won't change their mind from you and I doing something, but the Spirit of the Lord can get them. Holy Spirit, the hound of heaven can go after them. But that is the word he said. You have an unrepentant. First of all, it's hard. Hard. It's also unrepentant. It's moving in the reverse of a mind change. Heart is cardian. And interestingly enough, cardian is never used literally of the physical heart in scripture. Never. Every time you see the word card cardia or cardian, it is always used figuratively of the center of human life. That's why when, understand, uh, when we sing that chorus, come into my heart, come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, I understand that many children think that he's really coming into that little fist thing and oh, come into my heart. He's going to live right in my heart. But understand, that is a very, very welcoming chorus to sing. Because what we are singing when we say, into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. We are saying, Jesus, you come into the center of my life. You come in to the center of my thought. You control my, th you come in, Lord. You sit on the throne of my thoughts and feeling. Lord, you rule my feeling. So the heart spoke of the wellspring of a person's spiritual life. Where that center of everything in your spiritual life. Yes, Nicole? Uh, center of human life, thought, and feeling. The heart, the heart spoke of the wellspring of a person's spiritual life. Mm -hmm. So cardia is the inner person, the seat of motives. Should our motives be different after Jesus comes into the center of our being? Yes. And attitudes. The heart is the center of personality. It also includes the thinking processes and the will. Should we have a different direction for our will when Jesus is living in the center of our being? Yes. And I'm giving you the reference of Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs, getting 4.23. Guard your heart diligently. Now that's some good that's good advice for us physically, but this is speaking about what? The center of your being. You guard the center of your be being diligently, for from it flow the springs of life. Everything. Your motives, your feeling, your attitudes, all that come from the most innermost part of your being. And then I also gave you Matthew 15. Matthew 15, I think it's 19. Is that for Sharon? Yes. Vicky. The center of your being, feelings, and what else? And life. Life. Okay. Oh, I, okay. The, the thoughts, the feelings, the life, motives, attitudes, personality. Well, all of that springs, all of that springs from the heart, the the spiritual heart, the, 
the innermost part of our being. Thank you. And that's why Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs says what? Guard your heart. Why? Because what you allow to come into your heart will affect all of those areas. And then Matthew 15, 19. For out of the heart, now, if you don't, you don't guard it. You let anything come into your the innermost part of your being. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. So what is he saying? Well, this is the this is the opposite of guarding your heart to have the Lord come into the center of your being and rule and reign there. It starts in the heart. Why? Well, will those those things affect your thoughts, your feelings, your motives, and your attitudes? Yes. Now, I know 43, storing up. So you're storing up something. And he, and he says in the passage that we read to us, storing up. Storing up for the judgment. Again, a uh, very interesting word. And I'm sure you've heard this word before. It's the sarazais, from which we get our word the source, which is a treasure of words. Is it called treasury of words? All words that, you know, are used. So Paul's saying these people are treasuring up wrath as their lifelong activity. Now they don't realize that they might be storing up wrath for themselves, but that's what they're doing, just storing it up. And this word, uh, the sorazice, means to do something that will bring about a future event or condition. My, my dad used to have a, a saying, and I remember it all the time. And what he would say was, God does not always pay off in December. <laughs> and he meant it both in positive ways and negative ways. Because sometimes, you know, you, 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 you do, you're serving the Lord, and giving, you're doing all the things that the Word of God says to do. And, and it looks like, uh, now, there are certain people out there, I have a word for them, uh, uh, hucksters, and they'll tell you it's going to happen instantaneously. Just do it now and everything's good. And it doesn't. But the one thing he, he said to me, he said, God doesn't always pay off in December, but he always pays off. You can trust him to pay off. Well, that happens both positively and negatively. Because the Word of God says we're also storing up treasures for our eternal life, right? Rewards maybe no one saw, but God did. And in the same way, these people are doing, and they're doing some storing up too. So these people were treasuring up wrath for future punishment. Just as if they were building up a fortune of gold or silver. Building up, building up. When we, when we read the book of Revelation, remember there were the souls under the altar? And they were saying, how long, O oh Lord? How long do you vindicate us? God, God says, just wait. It's, in essence, it's coming. Just, just, just wait. Remember this, both positively and negatively. Delay is not denial. See, many people say, well, have you ever heard anyone so blatantly, and I have before, by the way, well, if there's a God, let him strike me dead right now. <laughs> I've had people say that to me. And then when it doesn't happen, see, I knew that wouldn't happen. You know what I say? Delay is not denial. And if God is delaying, it's he's giving you time to come to your senses and for the spirit of God to do a work on you. And you ought to be thankful. In the same way, God has promised you and I some good things. 
and delay is not denial. It looked, I mean, do you understand the 400 years of silence from Malachi to Matthew? Because Malachi prophesies and says what? The Son of God will rise with healing in his wings and 400 years of silence. And then the angel Gabriel went to a virgin in Nazareth. Delay is not denial. And in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin. Delay is not denial. If God has promised you something, know this. It may look like there's a long delay, but guess what? Doesn't mean it's denied. Right. Sharon? Even, even the rapture, people say, well, where is, mm -hmm. you know, we've heard this for years, you know, he's going to return. Yeah. Not, delay doesn't mean denial. No, it does not. Delay doesn't mean denial. He that shall come will come. Yeah. He will come. And, and by the way, we're closer to the rapture of the church tonight than we were last Wednesday night. <laughs> and and if you begin, you know, I have never, I will tell you this, there has never been a year in my lifetime like this year. What do I mean by that? Where I have seen more things happening in rapid succession. And that's in my lifetime. And I'm old, but I'm not ancient, I'm just getting there. <laughs> and remember when we read Revelation, what it meant soon? That when the things start to happen, you know, it may have taken this time to this time for this to happen, but then you're going to start happening things like this, and that's exactly what's happening. It's not delaying his coming, he's coming. Yes. Because of this, because of the stony heart. Yeah. And by the way, the seed was the same, was it not? <laughs> the seed was always the same, whether it was thrown on the, on the well-trodden path, whether it fell in good soil, whether it fell on rocky soil or, or stony soil. It was the same seed. And it's the same seed that falls on different soil, but soil that would receive it, because some was what? 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. It was still a harvest, but a lot had to do with the condition of the soil. It always had to do with that. So the, it's, the same, it's the same word of God going forth, but is your heart a heart that will receive, or is it a heart that's hardened and reject? So we have to distinguish. Now this is speaking, I believe, to us as well as to those that Paul was speaking to. We must distinguish eternally worthless human works from spirit-empowered good works. Are there just some human works? Well, I'm just going to I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to grit my teeth and get through this. Or they're spirit-motivated, spirit-empowered works. And again, that has to do with what? It has to do with who's residing in your heart. And we've got to determine the difference because in the rewards judgment, those things that were just done out of human good works with the motive of whatever the motive was are going to burn up. Those works that were done with the motive as unto the Lord are going to what? They're going to, they're going to still be standing. Now, Revelation, and again, this will be a familiar Greek word to you, apocalypsios. Apocalypsios. Remember the apocalypse? 
And actually, the book of Revelation in Greek is what? The Apocalypse of Jesus. The Apocalypse, the, the Revelation of Jesus. And as I said back in when we studied the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is not the revelation of the Antichrist. Everybody's looking for the Antichrist in all the, all the scriptures in Revelation. No, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ that was, that was given through him to John. So Revelation conveys the idea of removing a cover. Remember, we talked about that Revelation, book of Revelation, removing a cover so that something previously unknown is now manifest. There it is, manifest, seen, and exposed to open view. So Revelation here in this passage refers to something once hidden becoming fully known. And fully known. <coughs> so what's going to be revealed? God's judgment. And by the way, it's righteous judgment. It will finally be revealed. So all of those questions, how long, O oh Lord? You can't look around even today without saying, how long is this going to go on? I don't know, just the pandemic. But what we're seeing, rights, calling right wrong and wrong right, and, and it's just, and how long, oh Lord? Well, delay is not denial. It will come. And it will, God's righteous judgment will be revealed. There are going to be some very prominent people very shocked and surprised. In verse 6, because Paul, and let's look at it, so, because we read quite a bit of scriptures all at once, he will pay back each person according to his deeds. Pay back. So he is not describing the basis for salvation. We are not saved by our deeds. Our salvation does not come by what we do or don't do. Our salvation comes what? Because we have put our trust in the power and the efficacy of the atoning work of Christ. That's the basis for salvation. What did you do with Jesus? But Paul is saying that there is a, going to be a basis for judgment. So the, he's not describing the basis for salvation, but the basis for judgment. So deeds are one of the elements or principles that God employs in judgment. So the wicked will be punished both because of their deeds, because remember, and I've given a reference there to Matthew eleven twenty four. So in other words, because your deeds are evil, but also according to their deeds. In Matthew 20, 11, 24, so in Matthew eleven twenty four, 24, <clears throat> he is speaking here about the uh, one of a uh, very interesting area, actually, in Israel. And it is uh, called what we call the Gospel Triangle. And the reason for that is if you would, you know, if you get a bird's eye view of these, these areas and you put dots on them and then you went from them, it would form a triangle. And so that area is called uh, the Gospel Triangle. And it was made up of Capernaum, Chorazin and Bethsaida. And those, that area within that triangle saw most of the ministry of Jesus, most of the miracles of Jesus, and yet took advantage of it and didn't go any further. So Jesus is saying, 
that nevertheless, I tell you that it will be more bearable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Now, I want you to think about what Jesus just said there. Because I don't have to I don't have to tell you about Sodom. Because we kind of had some references to Sodom as we looked at chapter one. And when we were in Jude, remember? Sodom and Gomorrah, and right, by the way, it wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah. It was a whole region around there. It was more than just those two. Now think about what Jesus said about Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida. And by the way, Bethsaida uh, was also the home of uh, Peter, James, and John. And Andrew. Because at the time of Jesus, the Sea of Galilee was on the shores of Bethsaida. That's not the way it is today. It's further inland, but obviously the, the Sea of Galilee has receded so. Now think about what he just said. It will be more tolerable. Now, is Sodom going to be judged at, in the Day of Judgment? Yes. Are the people who lived in Sodom going to be judged? Okay. And he said it will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom than for you, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin. What was he saying? Yes. In other words, based on what? Here's Sodom. Did they do wicked, awful stuff? And, 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 it, and it was not just that, that big sexual sin, but out of that attitude, evil heart, there was a whole bunch of other things, right? They didn't care about anybody else. It was all about them, whatever we can get. And you can see those sins because there was a time when, when God in the Old Testament points to his people and said, you're like your sister Sodom. <coughs> And then he begins to enumerate the sins. It's based on what? The knowledge they had. In other words, yes, they were despicable. They, they committed despicable acts. But they had less knowledge and less exposure to the ministry, the gospel of Jesus Christ than Sodom. They had more than Sodom did. Sodom had less than they, they did. And yet, they were guilty of sin. They were guilty of rejecting. They were guilty of not appreciating. Does that have a warning for us today? Yes. yes. Do, how much do we value? How much do we treasure the knowledge of the word that we have? and the knowledge of him that we have. Sherry? When you think of America and how much gospel has been put out here in this yes. country. I was listening to Rick Renner earlier today, and he's over in yes. Russia. And he said he left the United States and went to Russia because there was no gospel there and, and was ministering there. Now he's praying for America. Absolutely. And, and some of, uh, and uh, has a, um, I don't even know how to describe. God has given him a a special gifting to really point out this rejecting that we have. That and I say we as in, in in the collective of we in America have done with what we have been given. Do you realize the revive? I, I on Sunday I am actually going through from the early church all the restoration of truth that God has restored to the body of Christ in successive movements. Do you realize, that? and that happened here in the United States. And when you look at where we are as a nation culturally, I remember in 19, I'm trying to think what year it was now, I'm trying to think of the year, I think it was 90, I think it might have been 91. My mother and I went on a missions trip 
to Jamaica and not the touristy part of Jamaica, the non-touristy part of Jamaica. And um, the receptivity, I mean, it, we went on one night, we did a, one particular night I remember, we did, we did a street meeting and we ran out of Bibles. And there was a, a, a lady who, you know, run, ran one of the, like the little touristy snack shop type things and, and she said, I need your Bible, I want a Bible, 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 Bible. I said, we will get you a Bible tomorrow. We will bring a Bible back to you tomorrow. She said, and she wrote down the directions of where her little stand was. And we said, we've got to go back tomorrow. And so there were some others who were taking Bibles as well. Guess what? When we got there, she was waiting. I've been waiting for my Bible. That was new to us. Why? Because it seemed like here in the United States, you have to tackle somebody to tell them about Jesus. Come on. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. And there was just such receptivity. Less knowledge. Less knowledge, but greater hunger. Yes. Value that we've got Bibles in practically every, you can get by a Bible at Walmart and, and well, we don't have Kmart anymore, but you can go dollar any dollar store you can get Bibles. Goodwill. Right, and some really, actually really some good books you can get. Uh, right. one of the, some of the best books I've gotten have been at like yard sales or I, I really look for books. I'm a book fiend. I am drowning in books and <laughs> at home and my office, everything, but I love books. And I remember remarking to, to my mother, I said, this has really opened my eyes. But it, it showed me a microcosm of what it is to have little light, but to receive it so quickly, and to have great light, and to treat it so cheaply. Yes, Christian. Um, would you mind reading out of the two, like Psalm 10310? <laughs> Psalm 10310. <laughs> Psalm 10310. He has not treated us according to our sins or repaid us according to our iniquities. You want to know why? Because this is looking, David is looking toward the atoning work of Christ. And because of that, he's, that's taken care of for us. That was taken care of at the cross for us. He hasn't. He has not. He hasn't repaid us according to our iniquities. He hasn't treated us according to our sins. Why? Because our sins have been taken care of. Yes. Because our condition of sin yes. has been taken care of. That's right. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, according to that, time's up. And I know we've, we've covered quite a bit tonight. Um, kind of. Um, we try. I will tell you, once we probably get to chapters 3 and 4, we may go even faster. If you'll notice, I, I have dealt with words, the Greek words, more in one, chapters 1 and 2, and there's a reason. Those words, while familiar with probably half the class, maybe not so familiar with the other half. Once we get in, a little bit further in, I'm not going to do, I, I may reference them, and you can, I know you Greek people will want to go and dig them out, but um, we will not do so much language as it is, we'll just be looking. But some of these words, it's important. It's important to know metanoia. Very important to know that. Um, and, of course, emuna, and righteousification, the kaya word. So, and of course, we're going to look at hoopamonia again next week. So, if you need notes, if you are if you are watching on the internet tonight and uh, you need, want, like the same notes we're using, if you will look below where you are watching, you will see the notes are there. You may download them and print them out for yourself. 
If you cannot do that, for some reason you don't have a printer, and you need those notes, all you need to do is call 330-453-2519 and let us know you'd like to have those notes sent to you. Give us your name and address and we'd be happy to send them to you. If you would like to give in response to the teaching you've received, there are many ways to give. You can mail it in, you can text to give. All of that is on the website. I'll be looking at you next week again. We invite you to, if this is the first time, join us again next week. Please let me know that you are watching. If you are there and you want to participate in our project of helping a young man go to Israel, you can also send in a donation if you would like to do that. If you would like to go to Israel with us, May the 6th through the 17th next uh, year, which is 2021, <coughs> all you need to do is call the same number and request an Israel trip brochure and we will send it to you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and keep reading God's word tonight.